All right. Um, this is Benjamin Wittes. And Tamara Wittes. And we are going to get started in a few minutes. Uh, so let's uh, first bring in all of the folks who are actually going to be live on this show. Uh, Shane, Susan, could you please make sure you are unmuted and your uh, 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 video is on? Can you hear me? I can hear you. This is what it sounds like where I live now. The angelic voice in my ear. Yeah, so this is really awesome. Uh, save this for the B-roll <laughs> and the witty banter on the show. Um, so here's how Don't this is going to. Yeah, here's how this is going to work, folks. We got a lot of people in the <laughs> audience. We got a lot of questions. We uh, want to take as many of them as we can. Um, we, are, if you raise your hand, I promise you, I will ignore you. Uh, if you want to ask a question on the show. Uh, leave it in the Q&A, leave like just a, a sketch of what you want to talk about. I will, we will see that. We will probably not get to all the questions because there are a way a lot of them, but we will take the ones that we think are uh, uh, the most appropriate for the show. I will magic you in and you can then ask your question live. Um, so, but please, uh, if you just raise your hand, uh, I won't even see it. Um, and plus, if I do see it, I'll assume you're a Zoom bomber, not a real person. <laughs> Second point, if you are a Zoom bomber, Goodbye. Um, <laughs> we will dismiss you with a shocking lack of due process. Uh, and uh, so don't try to be disruptive. If you feel like it, you can try. We're probably not gonna, we're, you're probably not gonna be able to ask the kind of question that we want, but go for it, give it a shot. Um, uh, other administrative matters, um, uh, have fun. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna have some fun with this and, um, uh, we will, uh, be, uh, uh, eager for your feedback, whether we should do this kind of thing more often, uh, and, uh, you know, in, in a serious vein, uh, I've been doing a daily live Zoom show like this uh, off of Lawfare. So we've been trying, starting to talk about what we might do on a kind of more regular basis with this format. Uh, so if you have thoughts on this uh, experience, uh, please uh, do share it with us. Thanks to everybody for joining. We will get started in a couple of minutes. And until then, we're just gonna, you know, sort of shoot the shit in front of you and, and uh, you know, enjoy the pregame show. This is not scotch, unfortunately. What are you uh, drinking? I may have some scotch. I have a Diet Coke. You could put a little scotch in that. You could. Or rum. I used scotch in a headline the other day, or not me, but somebody thought they had said something about, they didn't understand scotching as to get rid of something, and someone thought we were writing a story about people banning scotch. <laughs> because Hi. plans were scotch. That would and they got very nervous. That is a reason to get nervous. All right, should we get started? Are we ready? Is it two? Yeah, all right. Let the show it, begin. It's kind of 2.30, you know? It's 2.29. Oh, so we should wait till 2.30. Yeah, because we did say sharp. Any stragglers? Sharp. Okay. We did. We made a point Not of saying 2 sharp. 2.30 dull. Sharp. <laughs> okay. Um, Hold my pen. You tell me when, Shane. <laughs> you, you, you're the boss, dude. Just say so when you want me to go. Listen, I'm in charge, damn it. Yeah, um, I'm in control here, as Alexander Haig once I said. I am the captain now. Oh, it's 2.30, okay, whatever, you can start. Then. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to a live oh, taping of Rational sound. Security. I'm Sophia Yan, perhaps better. I'm gonna try that again. This is going perfectly. <laughs> this is We're going doing so it, well. Guys. It's ben so just, good. Ben okay, just shut everybody. Up. Did Ben just accidentally leave? I don't know. Did. Oh my God. <laughs> this live is good. You know what? Folks. This is giving listeners a little behind the scenes look at what usually happens in rational security, okay. which so is just we're a on shit show. Yeah, right. Exactly. exactly. 
<laughs> no, Shane, the president was bad to do that. Well, my sources have told me. Um, we're going to try and find Ben. He says, hold tight. He's coming back soon. <laughs> I really like that painting behind you. This one? Mm -hmm. this is a Did Joe your husband DeFeo. do that? This is a Joe DeFeo original. Peter There's something Joe. like it's like looking up at trees. There's something like very it calms me. Yeah, it's called uh, Overstory. There is a sequence of them. I forget which number this is, but that is exactly right. You are looking up into a tree canopy. How lovely. Uh, and he also did this one. Where's my pen? There. Which is a representational work. This is a little bit representational and abstract too. Let's just do this as the podcast. Let's just do, Let's do this. a walking tour of the Harris DeFeo art exactly. collection. He may be out there in the dark someplace right now. <laughs> Watching, peering. <laughs> He's going to start firing off q and A's. <laughs> we do have a lot of Q's coming up. Hold on. We do. They're pretty good questions, too. That's very good. Sorry, guys. We will figure this out in a few minutes, in a few seconds. It's better this way. This is, this is what you wanted. So much more fun. It's just me and, me and Susan are just going to do the show. It's not going to be recorded. And we're not going to talk about national security. <laughs> we're we're going to say mean things about mutual acquaintances, which That's is what we it. usually do. Welcome to the airing of Grievance. Oh, look, he's back. Hey. Okay, am I back? You are here. You are. And better than ever. Yeah. New and improved. I cannot months. hear anything, though. This worked so um, well in rehearsal. I know, you guys, we really did. You we, can, like, Susan, can an you hour hear me? Ago, I can't can hear you. you. Uh, um, all right, I cannot hear any of you, um, which is gonna make this, gonna make this rather difficult. Um, I promise you guys, we did sit down 45 minutes ago, and this was all perfect. All right. There were no issues. How about this? Are, are we good now? I can hear you. Yeah, we hear you. All right, let's try this again. Okay. One more time. It's gonna be worth it. You're gonna love it. Yes. To a live taping of Rational Security. Whoops, gotta I'm start it at the beginning. Perhaps <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to a live taping of Rational Security. I'm Sophia Yan, perhaps better known as this podcast's official pianist, because what podcast doesn't have one? Uh, I wish I could be there in person with you all, but I am in Beijing, and uh, alas, if I am still tinkering on my piano, by the time you guys see the rest of the Rat Set crew, my neighbors will be very upset. It will be the middle of the night here. Uh, so here's a bit of what regular listeners know so well. I do have to apologize in advance because my piano is a bit out of tune. Turns out it's kind of hard to get a tuner in into your house in the midst of a pandemic. Enjoy! I can see all of you. I can see we you can too. See you. Who are all these people in the room? Oh my God, oh, they're lovely, virtual. There are 300 people. people. This is not how we record the podcast. And it what is. is Sophia doing here? Sophia's yeah, piano sounds fine. I don't know what she's talking about. But I, I thought she thought we would judge her. Like that no. knee was a little pinchy. Yeah, a little pinchy. I like how she thought we could tell it was out of tune. <laughs> Listen, Room Raider, you can't man. Get piano tune during a pandemic. When can you get a tune? Don't you think it's an essential service? I think she snuck in a piano tuner actually earlier in the pandemic. Is Sophia in here with us? Whoa. I do miss her. I miss her so much. I feel it's like nice I to be able to see her right face now. as she plays us music. And to wash her hands. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wait, mm -hmm. I hear something. Wait, is it? <laughs> it is! <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Rational Security, the Ask Us Anything Live edition. Hello, Sophia. It is so good to have you here, even if virtually. I am Shane Harris. Uh, I am here in the jungle-ish studio, as you can tell behind me, and I am joined by my good friends Susan Hennessy, Mara Kaufman, Wittes, and Ben Wittes. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Shane. And hello to you <coughs> out there, the many, many hundreds of you that if you were here right now, if we could hear you, we would hear you scream or applaud. 
one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> we would hear you shut off your computer and run away. <laughs> I'd be like, I didn't pay for this, did I? I'm not being charged. Shane, they never pay for this. <laughs> never pay. Don't worry. Although I have a Venmo account, and you're welcome to send everything to it. Um, we are we're worth what you paid for. Totally. We're worth every nickel. Uh, <laughs> we are delighted to be here with you guys right now, uh, near and far. We have people joining from uh, all over the world. I think we can technically say that, or at least two countries, maybe. Um, that counts. That counts. That counts, totally. There are multiple places in the world in multiple time zones. Uh, Sophia is probably asleep right now, but we're thrilled that she could join us. This is, uh, this is a unique show for us. We have done live shows in the past, never quite like this, and never remote, but uh, we're feeling And usually lot. the audience is drunk yes, in our normal in previous Usually lives. we are more drunk than we are right now. Totally. We've actually Speak only ever done live shows in bars. That is a fact. You know, I just want to say we have, uh, like, we are totally game for this. We're going to take your questions, you know, and, uh, you know, you should uh, send them our way. A lot of you already have done. So Shane, who should we magic in for the first question? Well, we have got so many good questions, but there is one from Nathan Floria. If Nathan is here, uh, that I think would be a great way to start. Ben, do you find Nathan out there in the dark with all of our friends? Uh, no, Nathan Floria does not appear to be here. Nathan, you asked a question, but you didn't join, but that's okay. Uh, I will read Nathan's question. And what we're also gonna do is we can see your questions coming in. So as we're going, uh, we will bring people up and kind of turn on your mic and you can ask your question to the group. But what I wanna start with with Nathan's question is it's very on point in the news, uh, is building off the stories that we reported yesterday in the post uh, and others as well. Uh, on the whole question of unmasking, which doesn't that sound timely? You should not be unmasking in public to be very- No, you should wear remain your mask. masked. Mask wear your mask. Michael Flynn, even you have to wear the mask right now, just so we're <laughs> clear. But uh, we'll remember back, the listeners will remember back in 2016, there was this whole question of who unmasked the name of Michael Flynn uh, in a report or a transcript pursuant to his conversations with Sir Kislyak, uh, which of course he later pleaded guilty to. We talked about this on the podcast last week and DOJ moving to drop those charges. But Nathan wants to know, uh, other than sort of fueling fuel for what he calls faux conspiracy theories, uh, what purpose does actually declassifying the names of people involved in the masking serve? And that was the news yesterday. Uh, and he also wants to know what would constitute unmasking that was improper or didn't follow standard rules? Would that be actionable? Uh, uh, so Susan, let me come to you. What, what is the, uh, the, the practical purpose of publicizing, releasing the names of people who were involved in the decision to unmask Michael Flynn? Okay, so I'll take it as sort of a two-part question. So the first part of the question is what is served by declassifying the list of names? And from what I can tell, what they're, um, what's been declassified is the list of people who requested the unmasking, not necessarily the officials at NSA who did the review and answered the That's request right. and allowed for it. Um, it essentially, the, there's only one reason that I can think of, uh, one purpose this would serve, um, and that would be to facilitate a non-criminal leak of this information. So by declassifying the information and then sharing it with Congress, Congress, uh, you know, that pretty much assures that members of the media are going to get a hold of this list. Um, and that's going to allow for conspiracy theories to take root. And I think we've seen over the past week or two, um, the president and his supporters working really, really, really hard to try and sort of revive and gin up these various conspiracy theories about how Obama went after the Trump uh, administration, went after the Trump campaign, uh, and sort of the Mike Flynn unmasking controversy is part part of that. Um, so it, sort of to understand the significance about uh, what's happening, because surely there will be reporting, because surely these names will be leaked if they haven't already. Um, it's just important that people sort of understand like what masking and unmasking even is, what minimization is. Um, and so if you're an analyst at NSA um, and you're preparing an intelligence report, um, so you have like a topic, great counterterrorism, or you have a target, a foreign person, and you're trying to prepare these reports to tell other people uh, information 
potential they need to know. So you're looking through communications. And as you look through communications, you find stuff that's relevant. Whenever you look at something relevant, you say, hey, is there anything involving a US person? So it might be that it's a foreign person speaking to another foreign person talking about a US person. Remember, also it could be a US company. Um, or it might be a foreign person who's talking to a US person and that person's being incidentally collected on. So the first thing you ask yourself is, is this US person, their name or identity, necessary to understand the intelligence? So it's necessary to understand the intelligence, it just goes as part of the intelligence report. That's the threshold. But in some cases you say, look, you don't really need to know this person's name. You don't really need to know this person's identity or this entity's identity to understand what's going on here. And so we're going to put, we're going to mask it as part of the minimization process. And it just slaps a little thing on top of it that instead of, instead of saying Shane Harris, it says US person one. And then the Intel reports go out, they get distributed lots of different places, lots of different intelligence consumers. In some cases, a particular intelligence consumer, for example, somebody at the White House, a national security official, will be reading through this report and, and because of their role or because of other information they know, they need to know that person's name, right? So they're saying, hey, here's two foreign persons that are talking about a US person um, who they believe they can get classified information from. Um, I wanna know, uh, is that person actually in a position to give classified information? Like, is this just random or is this someone maybe who works for me? What, what I, I need to know this person's identity. And in that case, they make a request to NSA where they explain why they need this, why they need the name to be unmasked. And then if the person at NSA agrees to that request, so it meets the legal standards, they give the, the, the name of that person's identity just to the person who requested it. Um, so this is a really sensitive decision at NSA. Um, I think Mike Rogers said that only about 20 people in the entire agency uh, were his designees to, to make this decision. But um, there's nothing nefarious or, or wrong. Uh, maskings and unmaskings occur every single day. It's just a routine part of intelligence. Okay, so soon we will know, uh, we will unmask the unmaskers. Um, let's go to our first live audience question. Uh, ben, why don't you bring up uh, Josh Fillion for a question? Josh, the floor is yours. Perfect, thanks for doing this, guys. Uh, so, given that the United States has pulled out of the JCPOA and refused to provide sanctions relief to Iran during a global pandemic, um, you know, especially considering Iran has been so hardly hit by COVID-19, how does the U.S. move forward on Iran policy as it relates to the nuclear program, assuming, of course, that uh, Trump loses in November? I love that everyone um, has passed the mic to Tammy. Iran, Yeah, Jacoba, did you Tammy. notice that as soon as you said, Joshua, JCPOA, Ben was like, here, you, here. you do this. Well, you don't expect me to answer hard <laughs> questions, do you? <laughs> Give me some damn law. Give me something that oh, will get the right there. answer. You. you know, you, well, what should we do about Iran? You give the mic to Tammy. Sure. Um, All right, Tammy, you're up. So assuming that Trump uh, loses in November and we have a new U.S. administration, um, that administration is going to face a challenge in rebuilding trust in major international relationships. And those relationships are going to be necessary for any serious policy undertaking, including trying to deal with the ongoing confrontation over Iran on its nuclear program and Ira other Iranian activities in the region. I think that you're likely to see, therefore, first a round of intensive consultations between the United States and European uh, partners. You're gonna see intensive consultations with China and with Russia. Um, because of their roles uh, on the UN Security Council and because of their economic engagement with Iran. Um, and you're going to see some near-term decision-making uh, due from, the, from a new administration on whether and how to maintain the existing sanctions, especially the secondary sanctions that have shut down Iran's ability to, to um, sell any oil on global markets. And so I think that you know, there may be a desire to create the conditions for re-engagement, but there's also going to be uh, a necessity of ensuring that you're going to have coordination and cooperation from other states with whatever you do. And uh, a new administration isn't going to want to look like a sucker. And so despite the desire to shift tone, they're going to have to see something from the Iranians in terms of change behavior 
to justify a change in American policy. All right. Ben, let's hear from Renee Murphy. Indeed, Renee. Hello. So my question is about the U.S.'s role as a leader in the world. Um, prior to COVID-19, we had lost our place because of the Trump administration's stepping back from a leadership role. And now with COVID-19, there's something of um, some measure of disarray with regarding the world and how we all work together. And there is no clear leader. So my question is, because China, so China is the natural person or the natural country to step into the fray and become the de facto leader. So because COVID-19 began in China and they have their hands full and it is a big hotspot, they have not been able to take advantage of the absence of US leadership. And so now what I see, and I just wonder if I'm being too optimistic, I see that if Biden is elected in November, because of the fact that the Chinese government, government has not taken advantage of our absence, that there still could be a way for the United States to step back into a leadership role. That's my question. Is that? Oh, I think she meant, is that, uh, sorry, I cut her off. Uh, I thought she was done. My apologies. Um, yeah, was, is, that, is that unrealistic thinking? Is that unrealistic? Uh, yeah. Look, I think that is exactly right. Um, there are very significant reasons why China uh, is impaired in its ability to simply step in for the United States. One is um, that it actually does not have trust from a network of allied countries that are ideologically sympathetic to it around the world. And, you know, uh, the president likes to uh, disparage our allies, but the truth is that the scope and range of American strategic allies around the country, around the world, is actually our biggest uh, source of power other than the power that we can generate ourselves. The second feature is that China does not play the same role in the international monetary system that the United States does. And so when you have a, uh, that is the, the yuan is not a reserve currency the way the dollar is. And so when you have a, uh, the United States step back, it doesn't create a void that another country steps into. It creates a void that another country doesn't step into. And that means there's a really big opportunity if Trump loses, uh, and it's also a challenge, not just an opportunity, to reestablish and some of the confidence that countries had in the United States before to reestablish the leadership role. And that is going to be a very hard project, but I agree with you that it is an opportunity that's there. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different view from Ben on this, and I'm gonna do it by stepping back a bit to say that what's happened here in terms of the, America, the loss of America's quote unquote leadership role in the world it's partly about the Trump administration and the way they've chosen uh, to approach American foreign policy and important relationships, but it's partly about changes in the international system that were coming already. Um, so it's more about the interaction between those two things. And I think that the changes in the international system make it more challenging for the United States to sort of be the global leader. You know, but after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and up until really a few years ago, the United States was the unchallenged global diplomatic, political, military, economic supreme power. We were the global hegemon, unchallenged. That's no longer the case. It isn't to say that we don't still have the strongest economy in the world uh, and the strongest military in the world, but the competitors, especially on the economic side, are growing. The nature of power in the international system is much more varied. So you have things like competition in cyber uh, capabilities, for example, um, and ways of using those both overtly and covertly. And so I, I think it's not simple. It's not a question of the United States kind of stepping away from a role and then stepping back into it. I think that the United States is in a more competitive international environment. And the other thing I think that's changed is that in these last three and a half years of Donald Trump, 
our normal international partners have learned that they cannot rely on us, that they can't uh, safely coordinate with us. And so they have started to work around us. And the structures and relationships that they've begun to put into place aren't going to magically disappear if a different person is the American president in January 2021. And so I think, you know, we're going to have to elbow our way back to global leadership and we're going to have to demonstrate that we bring something to the table that is more valuable to other states than the ways that they found to get along without us. All right. Uh, next up, good friend of the podcast, uh, Kate Sinatra. Floor is Who there. has an awesome scotch collection, so, <laughs> so we are told. That's my husband's scotch collection, but yes. Um, okay, I'll throw an easy softball legal-wise to you guys. What are your thoughts on Judge Sullivan's request for, is it, Amici, Amici briefs, Amicus briefs. Don Amici um, briefs. Amici. <laughs> and I took Latin. It, 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 you know, old old habits die hard. Um, and do you think that anyone will submit any on behalf of, I don't know, the defense or the bar? And then to Shane, I think you might have covered this. If I could get in a quick second one, uh, have you been following any updates in the Hallbank case? And if Zarab is cooperating with government prosecutors. And I don't know if I just read that recently. I don't know if you guys had any thoughts on those two issues. Thank you. Yeah, that's a blast from the past, Kate. And I will, I will give you the short answer, which is no. <laughs> I haven't been following it. So sadly, I can't answer your question on that one. But Susan, you can take uh, the question of, uh, you know, here this is to remind folks um, the Justice Department filed a motion to drop the charges against Michael Flynn. Uh, and Judge Sullivan yesterday essentially said, hold on a second here. I want to open this up to hear from people who might uh, be opposed to doing that. So why don't you answer uh, that question, Susan? Look, it's very, very unusual for a judge to ask for amicus briefs uh, in this kind of circumstance. And, and it is an indication, you know, that Judge Sullivan isn't done here. Um, that said, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical. I, I think there's a little bit of a belief that maybe this is Sullivan saying that he's going to move to sentencing, right? He's going to refuse to allow DOJ to drop these charges. And somehow he's going to come in and, and repair the harm here. I, I don't think that's um, really pl plausible nor necessarily appropriate. So I think what Sullivan is indicating at this point is um, that he is prepared to get the full story. And I, I think certainly there will be amicus briefs submitted. I would be surprised if these 2,000 former DOJ attorneys who uh, have written a public letter, if they weren't seeking to intervene in the case somehow, right? There, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's, there's a number of different parties here that, um, that certainly have an interest. Um, you know, the most Judge Sullivan can do is force DOJ to provide answers about exactly what happened and sort of get to the bottom of it. Um, that said, you know, this idea that somehow a federal judge is going to not allow DOJ to drop charges against someone, that's not really the role of the federal judiciary. We don't, we shouldn't want to expect judges to send people to jail when DOJ is saying they aren't, they aren't willing to prosecute charges any further. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to see what Judge Sullivan uh, says. Uh, I'm certainly curious to see to what extent he's willing to get additional answers and information out of DOJ. Um, that said, I think people, my expectation is that it's going to be sort of an information seeking exercise and that really the idea that Mike Flynn is going to be prosecuted or sentenced at this point, um, that's just not going to happen. And I have a question for you, which has been on my mind in all of this. If, correct me if I'm wrong, but the government is asking the judge to dismiss this case with prejudice, right? I correct. mean, essentially saying no more bites at the apple. Could the judge say, I'll dismiss it, but not with prejudice, thereby leaving the door open for a Biden administration, theoretically, to decide, you know what, I think we will prosecute Michael Flynn and we'll use his admissions of guilt against him at trial? Uh, short answer to that question is yes. Um, uh, uh, judge Sullivan could dismiss without prejudice. Uh, there's another thing Judge Sullivan could do, which would be really dirty pool, but he could do it, which is just stall. You know, um, uh, the, the case cannot be dismissed without the leave of the court. I agree with Susan that uh, it's very hard for me to see under the case law how he doesn't ultimately have to grant it. Um, but, you know, asking questions can take a long time. 
It's the um, Mitch McConnell option. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, I, I'm I'm being semi serious here. There are a lot of questions to ask, and there are a bunch of people at the Justice Department and at the FBI that you might want to put under oath to answer some of them. And by the way, Judge Sullivan once before had the uh, Ted Stevens case where he actually appointed a special master to take a whole lot of evidence about potential prosecutorial misconduct. And it took months. Um, and so I could imagine uh, Judge Sullivan really taking his time with this motion and really getting to the bottom of what's behind it. Um, and that actually sucking up uh, a number more months until maybe the Justice Department has cause to rethink its current position. And of course, ultimately, the president could just pardon Flynn if he didn't want to let him twist in the wind. Yeah, yeah I, I have to say, I understand the temptation of people who might like to see that kind of outcome or, you know, dismissal um, that would enable a future um, administration to resuscitate charges. But I, I'm kind of with Susan on this one. I think that we already have such a degree of politicization of the legal process in so many domains. I would hate to see an outcome like that because it would be seized upon by both political parties um, in a way that would be extremely polarizing and would further, I think, erode the public's ability to think of the judicial process as an impartial process. All right, next up, we're gonna take a question from Kevin R. Kevin, go ahead. Um, I'd actually submitted several questions, so I'm not sure which one you're thinking of. Pick but I your think, favorite. Yeah, the, the one that's on this topic um, relates to sort of rule of law in that it seems like everybody sees something fundamentally flawed with the rule of law in this country. You know, either you believe that the FBI is horribly political in pursuing Carter Page with the FISA warrants, or you believe that the FBI is generally incompetent with respect to FISA warrants. Um, with, with Flynn, which we were just on, you know, did the FBI corruptly entrap Flynn? Or is it that Barr and Shea and the DOJ are corruptly trying to dismiss this. But it seems like there's nobody in the middle who's actually saying that, yeah, the FBI and DOJ are doing a good job. So how can things be changed to rebuild trust so that people actually believe that rule of law is reasonable? That's a great question, a big one. Susan, why don't you take a first crack at like, I'm sure you think about this a lot, obviously, too, as a lawyer. What are what are practical first steps that people can be that our leaders can be taking to start to reestablish that trust? So, look. Um, ultimately, institutional trust can be destroyed a lot more quickly than it can be rebuilt. Um, so, I, I do think that there is uh, a middle that exists. People that recognize that the FBI and DOJ are largely reasonable, good faith civil servants who sometimes make mistakes. Uh, sometimes uh, policies need to be adjusted. Um, you can both believe that the FBI pursued the Russia investigation in legitimate good faith and proper legal predication, and also be really, really concerned about uh, the irregularities in the FISA process and what that might speak to in terms of sort of systemic problems with disclosure and Woods files and whether or not that process, uh, a non-adversarial process, really does serve the interests that it's supposed to. So I, I do think that sort of the, the middle ground position um, exists. I, I think I'm, I'm currently there. Um, you know, the process of rebuilding is going to be incredibly, incredibly difficult. And in some ways, it's going to be based on making some really unpopular and difficult choices, like not opening, not reopening a, a prosecution of Michael Flynn, like just allowing uh, career civil servants, career prosecutors to continue to stay the course in, in the post-Trump era um, in ways that doesn't insert political interference in order to rectify past wrongs, but instead is all about recommitting to this notion of 
there is there are limited narrow uh, channels in which the political body should be speaking to uh, you know to the Department of Justice and, and to the FBI and so the next president is going to appoint uh, an attorney general and potentially an FBI director who he or she has confidence in and then let them do their job and allow for the passage of time and uh, and just the the growth and, and, and rebuilding of of trust to occur sort of case by case, day by day, as, as people see sort of this return to, to normal process. And I, I, that's a little bit of a Pollyanna-ish view, I think, to think, well, it'll all just swing back to normal. Um, but I, I think that's certainly my hope. And I, I haven't heard anybody come in with sort of um, a, a big grand plan for, for how we restore things from here. I don't know, Ben, do you have a, a better I'm, I'm roadmap? I'm going to um, just two finger before I let Ben chime in on this, which is number one, I think that if you want to rebuild public trust, the most important ingredient is transparency. Um, it's not going to be about what people, you know, what rules people commit to. It's going to be about showing the public every day how you came to decisions in a way that they can rely on. Um, and so I think that the biggest questions for uh, officials of a future administration will be around disclosure of decision making, which is something that normally is kept pretty close hold. Um, you know, I, I think that this is also why, uh, even if Biden wins, it's not you know, like we're going to enter an era where Democrats are necessarily going to be politically ascendant because to the extent that a Biden administration chooses to take the approach that Susan is suggesting as a way of re rebuilding, you know, impartial rule of law, some of those decisions are going to be really unpopular. You know, Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon because he thought it was important to enable to the country to move on and, and rebuild trust, but it was really unpopular and he was a one-term president. Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I uh, agree with Susan's account of the general problem, but I, I also think it is possible to overstate uh, the, uh, or, or to be a little bit too balanced about the rule of law threat here. Uh, so the actual problem that have been revealed in the FISA process uh, are that in a whole lot of FISA applications, and we don't know how many, agents have been sloppy and have made mistakes. Um, now, if you said that about a big city police department with search warrant applications, people would say, duh, and nobody would talk about that as a big, deep rule of law problem. They would talk about it as, you know, uh, what do you expect? It's the NYPD. People are going to, people make mistakes. It's a complex organization doing complex things. We have rarefied the FISA process, and partly that's because we have wanted to, we've wanted it to be pristine. Um, because it's, it's kind of important that it be pristine. But um, what we've learned is that the FBI, in fact, behaves a little bit more like a normal police organization than we, uh, uh, than we had otherwise previously understood. Now, that's a serious problem, and we need to address it. But I don't think it is, um, I don't think it's a problem on the order, for example, of having an attorney general who is dropping cases against people who are favored by the president or, uh, you know, there are, there are rule of law problems and there are rule of law problems. And by the way, it's also not a problem uh, uh, that cannot be addressed. Um, and so I'm not sure you need, there's, I, I don't mean to diminish it. We need to take it very seriously and we need to correct it. Uh, we need to get the FBI performing at the level that we would want. But uh, I, when I rank my uh, deep-seated rule of law threats, technical errors in FISA are, uh, I would say, uh, a four on the rule of law threat, not an eight or a nine. All right. Uh, next up, Jonathan, I'm going to try and pronounce your name right on the first time. Is it Jonathan Equiozor? Equiozor. Equiozor. All right. I just had the accent on the wrong close, side. Uh, close, close enough. Okay. Uh, first of all, hello, hello, everybody. Uh, my question is for um, 
Ben and Susan. Um, is there an area, you guys seem to sort of agree on a lot of stuff. I'm just wondering if there's an area of national security where you guys most, you know, where you guys part ways the most, like what that issue might be or, you know, if there's, if there's anything. That's a good question. Where is the daylight between? No, we get a lot. We never yeah. <laughs> any conflict. It's the perfect. <laughs> this um, is like reality I, television. Behind the scenes, off camera, they <laughs> fight constantly. That's not Throwing true. The table. <laughs> it's not I true. Mean, like, I don't think we. I, I was trying to sort of think about this one. I I think there are a few areas in which our instincts are a little bit different. Um, you know, I, I think um, I'm more inclined to be a little bit skeptical of sort of certain members of the federal judiciary and, and sort of the regularity of certain types of processes than Ben uh, is. But I don't think sort of in a big way we approach these issues all that differently. Um, but we disagree a lot on the individual cases, right? Sort of lawfare is really a bunch of people arguing with each other and, and sort of debating these issues. So, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, one area in which um, I think you and I never came to an agreement on is uh, sort of going back to the FISA and, and Russia investigation. Um, despite both of us being really alarmed about sort of leaks and disclosures of classified information, um, I continue to put an asterisk by the leak of the Flynn Kislyak call uh, after the vice president had lied, um, not justifying it, but understanding why someone would feel that was an emergency that put it in a different category. Whereas I think, Ben, you continue to sort of be of the unequivocal view that any, any leaks of FISA information just cannot be justified. Um, whereas, like, I, I agree, but in that case, I, I think we never we're on the same page. Yeah, I think that's right. There's so it's very easy to go back and identify issues over which we disagreed. Um, uh, Susan, uh, for example, did not share my inclination to give Bill Barr the benefit of the doubt. I have to say, <laughs> I accede to her wisdom in retrospect. No, 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 no. You got to make that more explicit. Say, I was wrong. Susan was right. Yes, I ate. <laughs> she prepared for me a hot steaming plate of crow, which I consumed uh, with uh, a, 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 a Chianti. Um, um, so there are things like that. There are also uh, just issues that, I have a lot of background in that, you know, kind of predate Susan. Um, so for example, in the early days of the Russia investigation, Susan kind of came into my office and said, you know, we should really advocate for the uh, restoration of the independent council law. And I was like, no, <laughs> we shouldn't, um, you know? And so th there are certain issues like that, but I think one of the things about writing with somebody a lot is that you, it actually does cause you to homogenize your thinking about certain things. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I, there are things that when I type, I type them because I know I'm writing with Susan or because I hear her voice in my ear, I type them, they actually come out inflected by Susan's view of things. And, um, and so I think we probably agree on a great deal more than we would if we uh, say went off and didn't write anything together and didn't edit a publication for three years and together and weren't, you know, weren't, constantly sharing sensibilities, uh, both about individual pieces and about larger editorial direction. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, the Wittis households, oh. Ben and Tammy, are always of the same mind. hundred percent. hundred percent. Don't ask for me and Ben part ways. Um, Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Um, all right, so uh, Susan DeBorsi is up next. Uh, and yeah, you're unmuted, Susan, go ahead. All right, thank you, Shane. Hi. Hi. My Hi. zebra oh. picture, we like it. You like the oh, thank you. <laughs> My question is <laughs> that you guys- She's provided... not actually dressed as a zebra. <laughs> <laughs> not track. that you know of. <laughs> you might be, Susan. <laughs> be you, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so you provided some great answers under the premise that Joe Biden wins in November, um, particularly around relationships and our leadership role um, globally. 
what happens if Trump wins? Do you think it's going to be more of the same sort of incompetent malevolence, or do you think they could he could escalate further um, vis-a-vis Venezuela, China, Iran? Yeah, Ben, that's uh, your, your, your metric of uh, malevolence versus incompetence. How might that change in a second term? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, I, the concept of malevolence tempered by incompetence is organic to the interaction between Trump and the role. As long as Trump is in the presidency, that feature will, that will be a feature of it because he is both malevolent and not very good at it. And he surrounds himself with people who are uh, both really nasty folks and uh, really not all that able. And so that will be a constant. Um, I do think um, that that is a leadership style that uh, it's a little bit like COVID-19 in that, you know, you have a few cases and you say, well, it's not so bad. And then, you know, you get this exponential growth of uh, until you're in a very, very short time experiencing it as a, as a catastrophe, right? And I do think this leadership style kind of lends itself to that, uh, not with respect to, not just with respect to uh, exponential growth of, uh, of infectious disease, but also exp- exponential growth of disastrous outcomes, right? You, you get a few and you say, well, it's not that bad, right? Kim Jong-un, um, you know, so what? We had a summit, right? So what? We've fired half the intelligence community leadership. Um, but then they start coming closer and closer together, faster and faster with heavier duty compounding impacts. And you really do end up in a very, very bad place very quickly. And I, I, you know, I don't want to answer your question by singing it's the end of the world as we know it, but that's kind of how I feel about it. Yeah, I I don't think it can be overstated here. You know, this election really is kind of playing for all the marbles. And I think that a second Trump term, um, we wouldn't see more of the same. We would see a substantial acceleration um, in part because there would just be fewer checks. Um, I also think we'd see something else, which is that we wouldn't just have the damage of a second accelerated Trump term and what eight years of this as opposed to four might do. Um, I also think then we'll have sort of Trump having shown proof of concept that you can act the way he does. You can wield the powers of the presidency the way he does and not only not be removed from office, but win again. And then we're gonna have more Trumps and smarter Trumps and left-wing Trumps and, and, and sort of different iterations because he will have shown uh, a, a sort of a roadmap for uh, consolidating and abusively wielding power that will become very, very attractive to lots and lots of people who have incentives, you know, to, to behave the same, including, uh, you know, massive financial enrichment, um, but who have thus far sort of shared the belief that, well, you can't do this and really get away with it. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think the stakes can really be overstated for, for what would happen if Trump were to win another term. Yeah, I I think Susan's absolutely right. And I would also say that the whole notion of malevolence being tempered by incompetence um, presumes that uh, incompetence matters in constraining the exercise of malevolence. And so I think that, you know, if you're looking at a re-election, which is an electoral mandate for the bulldozing of norms, rules, laws, and procedures that we've seen in term one, um, then maybe incompetence, you know, or override or just bulldozing rules doesn't matter. And it's now got electoral approval. So I think that's very dangerous. And when it comes to foreign policy, of course, you know, the, um, the legal incompetencies that we saw in the first term have always mattered less in the foreign policy domain. What you would see in a second term, I think, though, is a different kind of incompetence, which is that uh, the bench of people to fill out a Trump administration on foreign policy, which was always thin, will be even thinner in a second term. 
And so, you know, if you think Ma Mike Pompeo is a bad diplomat, um, then, you know, you're probably going to see even worse in term two. And so, you know, and the rest of the world is already working around us, as I said before. So I think that that problem will get worse as well. All right. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Camila Urbina. And Camila, before, before I ask you a question, let you ask your question, uh, I have to say I, your legend precedes you. Um, <laughs> is, it, is it true that you may have once assaulted intentionally or otherwise a secretary general of the United Nations? America wants to know. <laughs> um, yes. So I was 22 and I was working for the Colombian mission to the UN in New York and this was my first job and I was part of the security council team and so we were at the informal sessions chamber and I was just waiting for the meeting to start and kind of slouching again I'm 22 I'm like stuck on my Blackberry right and I just feel somebody tripped on me and the room went silent and I look up and it was none other than Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the UN. Amazing. Just the, the, you know, the bus goes rush, they rush and everybody's quiet and then just begin to snicker. And, you know, for the rest of the time I was working there, every time he saw me in the corridors, he would just give me like a wide burst, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. He had no faith in you. <laughs> nope. So I, but I have a question about this, Camila. Um, um, are you, um, is this like something you are super proud of or something you're like super ashamed of? Very ashamed. I mean, you tripped the Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, yeah, very ashamed because I was the biggest like UN nerd that you could possibly imagine. And this is my dream job, right? I made it. And, <laughs> and I just tripped the most important person in the agency. And, then, you know, and now we're making her relive it. Yeah. <laughs> so great. I'm like, okay, but you, you did right have now. a question, right? Yes, Camila, now you, uh, please, please ask your actual question. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Now that we've embarrassed you, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, I'm from Colombia and, you know, I'm really worried about the condition of the U.S. and the Swallow relations and how destabilizing they are for the region. You know, what could be a good avenue for the new administration if there is one? And I just was wondering if you see any cohesive plan from the current one. Yeah, Tammy, go ahead. Um, okay, I'll start and, you know, I'll start by saying I am not at all an expert in U.S. Latin America policy, and it's a very, very fraught topic. But what I would say is that, you know, the, you, the confrontation um, over between the U.S. And the, and the Venezuelan regime, I think, has to be embedded in a broader conversation about the U.S. role in um, supporting democracy in Latin America and in the hemisphere. I think that prior to the last few years, there was actually um, a lot of progress within the hemisphere in building strong consensus across countries within the OAS uh, on behalf of democracy and building new rules and procedures within the OAS on dealing with democratic backsliding by member states. And so the initial um, approach to Venezuela under the uh, previous administration in the midst of this crisis was rooted in that. But I think, you know, maybe we all hit the limits of that multilateral mechanism as a way of dealing with the challenges of Venezuela. And I think that, you know, you come from a country that's dealing very directly with the economic effects and the refugee flows and, you know, and so then you're really getting into territory of, you know, um, impacting regional peace and security. And that begs the question of what we are all collectively willing to do about that. I'm sorry, my dogs are being extremely excited and loud, but I hope you could hear that beginning of an answer. Uh, okay, uh, so... So next up, let's hear from uh, Polly Calhoun. Polly, go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, we're seeing places like Hungary and Poland um, kind of decrease in their democratic ways. With our Justice Department, which I think is, is typically um, 
one of the strongest pillars in defending democracy, but behaving the way it is, how much should we in the US be worried about democracy decreasing? I'll offer a couple thoughts on that. Um, so uh, if the question is how concerned should we be, the answer is we should be concerned. Um, we are not hungry. Um, and the consolidation of the Orban power structure in Hungary has no analog in the United States. We are at a very early part of that process. Uh, if we are on that spectrum at all, we're at a very early phase of it. And uh, we have institutional defenses that have been very on display, by the way, in the COVID crisis, particularly with respect to things like federalism uh, that are not available in, in small European countries with highly centralized governments. Uh, that said, when the Justice Department, when the president you know, leads chance of lock her up and demands um, uh, that his Justice Department investigate his enemies and protect his friends, and when you may not see the Justice Department investigating his enemies, but you sure do see it protecting his friends, uh, that is a very alarming sign. And uh, I don't think we should be complacent about that at all. And I frankly, you know, I, I admire a lot of things about what Joe Biden is doing. Uh, one of the things he did very well during the campaign, uh, during the primary campaign, that was, by the way, not true of many of his uh, other uh, primary opponents, is he talked about rule of law issues. He talked about uh, the uh, sort of abuse of power issues. A lot of the other candidates were much more focused on sort of policy proposals. He actually focused on this stuff. Now he is not. Um, and I think that is, uh, I, I wish he were talking about it more in somewhat the same way that he did in that very uh, powerful opening speech of his primary campaign. I'll just wait, chime in on this too from you know, my perspective as, as a journalist, which you know, I think the fourth estate is an important pillar in the democratic process. You know, I, I, I spend a lot of time talking to young people and to students and through a, a program and news literacy that the Post actually does where we talk to high school students in particular about journalism and what we do and what we don't do importantly. And I think we as journalists need to do more of that because, I, in, and I would say in the past three years, this has really brought home <clears throat> more in a sharper relief, a problem that was there even prior to this administration, which is there's obviously a lack of trust uh, in the media as an institution. There is a real suspicion about our motives. I don't think we have a great deal of credibility. And I think partly that stems from people not really fundamentally understanding what it is that we do and how we do it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, continually amazed. I go give talks to groups of senior government officials and executives who don't know the difference between an opinion editorial piece and a news article and think that we are, you know, essentially we get in a room every day and write op-eds and that's what my job is. And there's something really off in our system if people don't even really understand how the news that we're expecting them to trust is generated. And so I would hope that you know, this is just kind of putting the onus back on us, I think, in the press a bit, um, that we will be much more aggressive in talking about how we do what we do and being transparent about it. You know, I, I remind students a lot, we're really used to having politicians say that we spin and that we're biased. Like, we get that. All politicians do that. What is unique in this administration is we've never seen a president tell people on a routine basis that the media is actively fabricating information. That is wholly different and distinct. And that is a real attack on the credibility of the press. It's deliberate. He knows it's not true, or he should know it's not true. And there's gonna be some real work that we have to do to repair damage that's been done, not just in this administration, but that is a particular um, uh, a point of tension that we just haven't seen from, from other White Houses, certainly, and from elected officials in my memory. Um, Susan, did you wanna chime in on anything in this too? And Tammy as well. Look, I, I share all of those thoughts. You know, one thing that um, I sort of struggle with where we go from here is, you know, there have been a lot of lines at which I'd assumed 
um, you couldn't, this couldn't happen at DOJ without triggering mass resignations. Um, and we've well since passed that line. And in, in, on one hand, I, I understand it, right? That each resignation becomes less significant than the one prior. It didn't really make that big of a difference. People feel like they can sort of put their heads down and maybe just wait this period out. Um, but the sort of the core institutional culture, um, you know, has taken a real beating. And so, you know, the idea that there would be this, this group of people that just wouldn't do this stuff, um, I, I think has sort of given, away, given way to the recognition that people have mortgages and it's maybe they, they won't personally do it, but they are willing to turn a blind eye while others do. Um, and, and that does change the way we have to think about um, legal protections, institutional protections, sort of formal mechanisms to repair moving forward. Because I think the sort of generalized faith in, uh, you know, the, the institutional uh, values of the Department of Justice, I, they have just been proven to be not nearly as strong as we believe that they were in the past. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I would add is that at the end of the day, the backstop to defend our democracy is us, us as voters, us as constituents who hold our public officials accountable, and us as civil society. Um, and if you look at other countries that have been beset by corrupt would-be authoritarians or beset by extreme uh, populism, um, there, are, you know, there aren't a lot that have come out the other side, but there have been times when elections have explicitly rejected those kinds of appeals and approaches. And I think if, you know, if we want to see our democracy survive, we are the ones who have to insist on that. Part of insisting on that, by the way, is not insisting on an eye for an eye retribution um, because that only reinforces the dynamic that uh, democracy is a, a war of all against all and the winner takes all the spoils and the losers get squeezed out of the system. That is not sustainable for democracy. And so there has to be a protection for viewpoints that lose elections. There has to be a, a, a protection for pluralism in the system. We can't just have retributive justice after the Trump administration. And it's up to us to make sure that things don't go down that road. We're going to circle back to that idea in, in just a few minutes, too. But Joshua Bernard, I'm going to let you ask your question next. Yeah, um, I feel like it's been so incredibly easy to lose perspective in the Trump era uh, because every week it feels like something is the worst thing ever. And I, I look back at the things that happened a year ago and I'm like, was that really as bad as I thought it was? It's just... Um, it, it's one of the it things was, Trump's good it at. It was all that bad. It really <laughs> yes, was. I, yeah, you were right yeah. every time you thought it was the worst thing ever. <laughs> it, it's just continuing to go downhill. But um, I, I guess it's, uh, to me, it's like important when we go into the election to actually have the perspective, especially when we're talking to people about like why we have a problem with the president. Um, and so one of the things I'm wondering about is like, while we're focused on all this nonsense, um, what are the things maybe that are national security concerns that maybe are underreported because there's so much noise going on or that the president isn't paying enough attention to that, um, you know, uh, that, that he's doing even worse? Susan, you want to start with that? Sure. So um, my old boss at NSA used to begin every morning by asking, what's the closest alligator? Like, what's the thing that's about to eat us that if we don't figure it out right now, we're screwed? And only after you answer that question can you get to all the other things that are headed your direction and long-term plan. So on one hand, I kind of want to defend the idea that there's like alligators right next to us and we have to be focused on it and we shouldn't necessarily be thinking of this as a distraction. It's like, it's an emergency that we're in the middle of. What's not being paid attention to is all that really important long-term, far away, big giant threats. 
nobody has their ball, the eye on the ball on China. We hear law enforcement every single time Chris Ray comes out to talk, every single time you get uh, you know, national security officials in front of Congress. They want to talk about China. They want to talk about the lights are blinking red there. They're really, really concerned about this stuff. Climate change, really, really concerned about climate change, barely even talking about it long-term things like like preserving technical supremacy over the long term in a functional administration you would have a very very smart team of people focused on the question of the race to quantum even if it's on a 50-year timeline as opposed to a five or ten year timeline that it probably is sort of understanding that we have to be thinking ahead to preserve sort of our place in the system um, and, and i think as far as far as we can tell from the outside all of that has been dropped, either because there isn't staffing, there's huge amounts of attrition, there's an incompetent administration that doesn't even care about that stuff, but also because the system is under such unbelievable strains in, in this current administration, in this present moment, that nobody can think in the long term. And like, eventually, we're going to pay the price for that. We, we just are. So I, I think there's an interesting question about when we say what's not being discussed, we have to ask what's not being discussed by whom. And Susan's comments are interesting in that regard because she says, you know, when these officials come up to testify, they want to talk about China, which tells you that within the government at the professional level in the IC, certainly in the Pentagon, you know, in the State Department, they are paying attention to China. They are talking about China. The national defense strategy is all about China, you know, but members of Congress aren't talking about it. Now in the public, we're talking about it, but we're not talking about, you know, the Chinese Navy. We're not talking about Chinese cyber attacks. We're not talking about, we're talking about China and COVID and maybe a little bit about China and disinformation on COVID. So it's, I don't want to suggest that there are threats that, you know, your government is not paying attention to. They're, the U.S. government is paying attention to threats in the Arctic that we're not talking about publicly. The U.S. government is paying attention to climate change, you know, and its impacts, including the U.S. military, but we're not talking about it publicly. And we're not talking about it publicly because our elected officials um, have gotten into a phase where they are engaged in charges and counter charges and they're just using national security as a bludgeon against one another um, and not trying to have a rigorous conversation. One of the biggest, most important national security questions I think we need to have a public discussion about is you know, what is our place in this changing world? I said before, we're not anymore in a world where the United States is the unchallenged hegemon. So the idea that we can or should try to maintain, you know, dominance um, in every region of the world, in every domain of warfare, in every domain of international power, I don't know if that's realistic, or even if it's realistic, is that where we want to spend our national resources as opposed to, say, national health care? That's a public debate about national security that we should be having. What is our role right, um, in, a, in a more competitive world? So that's the kind of conversation I would hope to cultivate. Um, I want to ask one last question here, which actually we've gotten a lot of questions about. So I want to kind of gather them up here. Uh, and pose it to the group briefly before we move on to our last bit of the show. Um, there have been several people asking, uh, obviously, about what happens in a second Trump administration, but there's also a lot of people asking about if the president loses in November and Biden becomes the president, um, will there be something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? What about the idea of, or fear of, perhaps, selective prosecutions? A lot of people are asking this question of, of is there something that a future Biden administration needs to do to sort of settle affairs or deal with, I think, what people are, who are asking the question would consider unfinished business or maybe even justice that wasn't served? Um, Tammy touched a little bit upon that, but Ben, let me ask you about that. I mean, this is, we don't usually use terms like truth and reconciliation commissions uh, in the context of American democracy, but I think it's speaking both to people's frustration with this administration but if I may assume a little bit here in the question, I think fears that people have about just the deep, deep divisions in our political system and in the country, 
which we don't spend a lot of time talking about on the podcast. I mean, I actually think there's a lot to be said for a kind of Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, the idea of which, as far as I know, was first floated shortly after Trump's election by Quinta Jurassic, our managing editor. Uh, I don't know if she ever said it publicly, but she started talking about it right away. And her language for it was at the end of, the, at the end of all this, we're going to need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I think the, the wisdom of that has really uh, grown on me over the years. And for the following reason, we have uh, two essentially irreconcilable narratives, right? One of which, and I will contend, I will cop to that, I believe this narrative. I believe it is objectively true that there was uh, a set of behaviors uh, in connection with the Trump campaign that was frankly disloyal to the country, that uh, a uh, reasonable group of people in the uh, law enforcement and intelligence community would have seen as deeply suspicious and were reasonable to, should have seen that way. So it was investigated in the course of which there were revelations of crimes, there were efforts to shut down the investigation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other side, however, has a completely different narrative of this, which is that there was a conspiracy to have a coup and undermine a legitimately elected president. Um, and, you know, having some structure to uh, get to a kind of, we're never going to get to a stable narrative, but to get to some uh, more stable shared account of what happened in this period and how we came to uh, hate each other so much and see the world so differently, I do think would be salutary. And I don't know what the right structure for it is, to be honest. Um, and I don't know how you prevent it from becoming as riven as the larger society, but I do think there's a lot of value in the idea. I mean, I think the problem with that for me is that it's predicated on this idea that Donald Trump loses and then rides quietly off into the sunset to spend his dotage reflecting on his many sins. And I can that's dream, not, can't I? That's not what's going to happen, right? You're going to have a, you know, you're going to have a post-Trump presidency in which a Truth and Reconciliation Commission or a 9-11 Commission style report or any continued focus on what happened in the past just becomes fodder to fuel the Fox News sort of, uh, you know, conspiracy driven narrative of conflict. And so I think this idea that somehow there's, there's one true truth to emerge, you know, I think we are going to need a serious commission looking at what went wrong with the pandemic. We're going to need commissions to talk about preventing politicization of the Department of Justice. We're going to need to, to think about how we sort of repair the structural damage. But if it's not all forward leaning and sort of forward looking and thinking about where do we go from here and, and kind of ignoring the debate about what happened in the past, I think we just end up getting stuck there for ever and spending the next four years of a new administration fighting about what happened in the last four years. Yeah, I couldn't agree with Susan more. I think that what we see, not just here, but around the world, is that populist leaders, left or right, um, end up using these debates about the past as a way of dividing people and as a way of distracting um, from areas where there is broader cross-cutting consensus in society. You know, we can debate who supported the Iraq war in 2003, and that will end up being a really divisive question. We can do the same thing with, you know, Obama immigration policy or, you know, Bush torture policy or Trump administration policy. Susan's right. If we want to build a wider basis for authoritative political outcomes in our democracy, we're going to have to look forward, not back. All right. Well, we're going to look forward now to object oh, yeah. lessons. Yay. But we're going to do object lessons a little bit differently today, though. I mean, we could actually physically show you an object, uh, but for folks listening. I have a physical object. Well, that you're going to get your chance. We're actually going to take our cue for this segment from a listener question we got from Nico Tomic, or it might be Tomic. Forgive me if I mispronounced your name, Nico. Uh, but Nico asks, 
we have all we all have that one activity we told ourselves that we would start if and when we had more time. Now that we're in quarantine, have you started that activity or habit, and what is it? Which I think is such a great question. Um, Susan, do you want to go first on that? Um, yes, I have picked up a few quarantine habits. I've been baking, although not bread. Um, and my results are not that great. I feel like other people are sort of like showing these results. Mine are like, it's, I made some peanut butter cookies the other day. I couldn't even get the two-year-old to eat them. That was the level of my baking skill. So that's sort of a, a like quarantine failure. Mm -hmm. um, on the successes, I have been reading more books totally unrelated to like my professional life. Um, I just finished John Hodgman's Vacation Land um, in lieu of actually taking a vacation. Um, very <laughs> enjoyable. Um, so I've actually like managed to work through a few novels and I, I'm like reading more books than I have had time to in the past. Um, but my real hobby, which I'm refining, is hiding from my children, including <laughs> right now. Just hiding so they don't know where I am. Nice, nice. Uh, I will share mine next. It's sort of in the same vein of Susan, which is that I've been using this time to go back and try and sort of like uh, fill in gaps in my cinematic knowledge, right? Like I feel like old movies are movies that you always meant to see, but you never did. And I'm just going to share one that I watched recently. I watched at home. Did you guys ever see Play Misty for me? No. no. Early Clint, Clint Eastwood film where he plays a jazz DJ in Carmel. Whoa. Like, which like clearly it's like partly a, it's a love letter. You had me at jazz DJ. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, I, but I don't think you, I'm not sure you would like this movie. For people out there who might have seen this, so basically he plays this Jazzy J and Jessica Walter, who is amazing, and people love like, her. Arrested Development and Archer, plays like basically a stalker fan who just, you know, cannot get enough of him. And she's always calling up and saying, play Misty for me. And this is her catchphrase. Wow. And then Donna Mills, remember her, plays the woman who like wants to be with Clint Eastwood, but he is such a dog in this film that he can't decide whether he wants to like keep sleeping with Donna Mills or five other women or like crazy Jessica Walter. And it is like, I don't, I don't think this film holds up. <laughs> this film does not make the cut anymore. And I mean, it's, it's a very flabbily directed film too, Clint Eastwood. You did much better work later. But I gotta say, I watched this movie and I'm like, why would anybody want to be with this jerk? It's <laughs> go back and you're like, Cool. Because he's Clint Eastwood, Shane. <laughs> no, hot. Like his hair is a, it's a mess. I've never found Clint Eastwood a child. I do not get it at all. I don't get it. I don't get the dirty, hairy thing. He was kind of hot and unforgiven. Very different film. But I just go back and watch this film, though, and you're like, I just like, why would anybody want to be with this character, even if you were insane? I just, I don't get it. Anyway, play Misty for me. Apparently, it's a classic. <laughs> Doesn't <laughs> Whoa, Shane! I have I have a movie question for you on on a rational security theme. Hit me. Have you ever seen the old early nineteen sixties movie of the spy who came in from the cold? Uh, I have seen that, and I read the book first, and I liked it very much. And it's um oh god, who's in it? Um, it is uh, Claire Bloom. Yeah, and um, Richard Burton. Richard Burton and, and Richard Burton. Richard yeah. Burton, unforgettable Richard Burton. Yeah, it, it, fantastic. I think it is one of the greatest spy movies ever made. It's great. By the way, a Rational Street listener recently wrote me and wrote to me and said, check out The Spy Gone North, uh, based on a true story of a, spy, a South Korean who infiltrated uh, into North Korea. So check that out. That's going to be on my list too. Uh, ben and Tammy, either one of you can go next. All right. I, I'm going to show you my, my object in just a minute in answer to that fantastic question. So I have long had on my list of, you know, when I retire, when I have more time um, playing music and I, I actually do still intend to go back and learn to play piano. But in the midst of the pandemic, uh, one odd thing that's happened is that my neighbors are, you know, cleaning out their basements and getting rid of things. And one of my neighbors decided to sell her guitar. And I used to play bad folk guitar in high school and college, like probably many of you, but I have not touched a guitar for probably 20 years. And when this neighbor put her guitar up for sale, I thought, what the hell? I'm home all the time. I might as well. So I have a guitar. 
Wow. <laughs> um, which I am sadly trying to rebuild calluses to play. And uh, it's definitely giving me a nice distraction. You think maybe you'll play for us on a future episode? I think that's a big hell no. <laughs> Come nice on, man. Try, Give the people what they want. <laughs> Give Shane what he wants, you mean. No way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben, what is, your, what is your habit, your new habit, your perfecting habit? Well, I can answer this question honestly uh, by saying that um, the new habit is that I have actually begun to do the dishes every day, <laughs> which <laughs> you have to understand that's a big change. It, it is, and we love him for it. Um, in addition, uh, I have decided partly in connection with uh, the In Lieu of Fun show, which Kate Klonick and I have been doing every day for the last 49 days, rain or shine, weekend or weekday at five o'clock Eastern time, that I should make a cocktail uh, every day at five, uh, both for myself during the show and for my bride. And so I have been learning all about things that you've known for a long time, Shane, like uh, uh, how to make cocktails. And I have actually been enjoying it uh, very much. And I have been enjoying it very much. I, th I think we should all go enjoy one now. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to have that chance because we are at the end of the show, you guys. Um, this has been a delight. We are so thrilled that everybody could join us. Uh, Rational Security, of course, as you know, is a production of Lawfare. You can find our show page at lawfareblog.com. You can find um, Tammy singing cocktail recipes at... Uh, and, you, and specially uh, Tammy signed guitars. Yeah, sure, exactly. <laughs> exactly. At wittishousemerch.com. <laughs> <laughs> you can follow us on Twitter at RATL Security. You can always find us on Facebook. Whenever you leave the, uh, download the podcast, please be sure to leave a rating and review. It helps others like you out there find the podcast, and it is a great joy to us to read your reviews. We appreciate it. How many stars, Susan? Five. Sorry, Five Susan. of them. Yeah. So or if I everybody, there are, you down there, there are 181 personally. people watching this right now. I want every single one of you, because like I'm sure two-thirds of you have never rated or reviewed the show, so just go on... Uh, iTunes or pod, uh, Apple Podcasts, whatever they're calling it these days, and just review the show right now. We appreciate it. You guys are the hardcore of the hardcore. Our audio engineer this week was Ian N. Wright, assisted by Zachary Frank of Brooklyn Goat Rodeo. Our uh, show is produced and edited, as always, by the wonderful Jen Patia Howell. Music this week by Michael Flynn, with his sassy version of the criminally overlooked Diana Ross single, Drop the Mask. Whoa! Whoa. Nice. You know what? I I thought you were going to call it Misty. <laughs> play Misty oh, for me, Michael Flynn. Flynn. Play Misty for me. Yeah. <laughs> it was good. It brought it all together at the end, Shane. It brought it all yeah. together. And it's so yeah. mm -hmm. here, she it's, a big, it's a closed loop. Just like <laughs> Um, you guys, yeah. you called in from Australia. You called in from Europe. I'm like blown away. I love you guys. Thank you. you guys Thank you, guys. Thank you so much on behalf of my good friend, Susan Hennessy. Uh, Benjamin Wittes and Tamara Coffin Wittes. I'm Shane Harris. We will see you all next week. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye guys.